Good evening. I'm Sandy Treadway, the Librarian of Virginia, and I am delighted this evening to welcome you to the 23rd annual and the first virtual Library of Virginia Literary Awards celebration. We are delighted that you could join us this evening to help us honor and celebrate the very best of Virginia authors and on Virginia books on Virginia subjects. I know that many of you watching this evening are usually at the library with us in person every year, attending our Black Tie Gala. And I wanna thank you for your support and for joining us tonight. Over the years, we have recognized such outstanding writers as Lee Smith, Tom Robbins, Barbara Kingsolver, David Baldacci, Rita Dove, John Grisham, Tom Wolf, Earl Hamner, Nikki Giovanni, and many, many other authors whose names might not be quite as well known, but whose writing has had a significant impact on our lives. The writers we honor tonight are continuing that tradition of excellence. Their works touch our minds, our hearts and our souls. The library is proud not only to promote the work of Virginia writers, but also to have a hand in creating those literary works. Many past winning nonfiction writers, quite a number of fiction and even a few poets have begun the work that culminated in their books by researching in the library's collection of manuscripts, newspapers, and vast array of photographs and images. We are proud that our incredible collections play such an important role in the development of new literary works. Now, as you can imagine, an evening like this does not happen without a great deal of hard work and advanced preparation. And I want to thank the Literary Awards Planning Committee for all their efforts this year. They have done an outstanding job of transitioning from the in-person to the virtual realm. I would also like to thank all the fiction, nonfiction, and poetry judges. They had the tough task of reading every nominated book and making the final selections um, which, was a, which was really tough. Um, and they have selected the finalists and the winners you'll be meeting tonight. I'd also like to thank the judges of the Art and Literature Mary Lynn Cotts Award for their outstanding um, work uh, when we celebrated uh, that author last evening. Now it's my great pleasure to share with you two messages from very special friends and supporters of the Library of Virginia. The First Lady and I are honored to welcome you to the 23rd Annual Library of Virginia Literary Awards. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. While we wish we could be with you in person to celebrate these amazing authors and the best of literature in Virginia, we know this year's virtual celebration will be just as spectacular. We would also like to welcome back the charming, the incomparable Adriana Trigiani as your host this evening and recognize tonight's gifted speaker, Dr. Douglas Brinkley. As one of the preeminent scholars on presidential history in the United States, we imagine that his talk will carry additional significance in this historic election year. Like all of you, the First Lady and I know that libraries are some of the best public institutions we have. They are the anchors of so many communities across Virginia, supporting literacy and an informed citizenry, providing access to critical services and helping close the digital divide. And our public libraries have risen to the challenges presented by the ongoing pandemic. They continue to offer students and families safe, supportive environments for remote learning. As the Commonwealth Library and Archives, the Library of Virginia is a treasure trove for anyone who wants to learn about Virginia history, culture, and government. 
So on behalf of a grateful Commonwealth, thanks for all that you do and congratulations to the 2020 Library of Virginia Literary Award finalist. Virginia is home to so many talented writers and storytellers who inform and inspire readers of all ages. And tonight is about honoring their incredible work. We hope to have an opportunity to see you in person soon. Until then, please continue to stay safe and have a wonderful evening. Good evening, everyone. I am Corinne Arnett, Senior Vice President for Regulatory Affairs and Customer Experience at Dominion Energy. I also proudly serve on the board of the Library of Virginia Foundation. I'm very honored to be with you this evening for the 23rd Annual Library of Virginia Literary Awards. As the repository, repository of so of much, so that much is that significant is... about and unique to Virginia, the library ranks among the Commonwealth's greatest cultural treasures. And those we honor tonight certainly rank among the state's greatest cultural contributors. The Library of Virginia, like all libraries, has always been important but it is especially important this year when many people are staying home to help reduce transmission of COVID-19. The scope of the library's digital collections is astonishing. We are thankful that the library has been able to continue to do its good work and very thankful that our Virginia authors continue to do theirs. Work through which the rest of us can be transported to other places, other times, and other perspectives. I also want to thank the staffs of the Library of Virginia and the Foundation, as well as the Literary Awards Committee for all the effort put into creatively bringing us this year's events. For many years, Dominion Energy has been proud to sponsor the Literary Awards. Our primary business is energy to power homes and businesses. And that energy is an absolute necessity for modern life. But we know it is not what people live for. We live for joy and adventure and love and hope and learning, all of which we can experience through books brought to us by libraries and the extraordinary people who write the books that fill them. As Elmore Leonard put it, libraries store the energy that fuels the imagination. And Dominion Energy is proud and grateful to be able to be a part of that. Thank you and enjoy tonight. Good evening and let me join Sandy and Corinne in welcoming you and the governor and first lady. First, I'd like to thank Governor Northam and the first lady of Virginia, Pam Northam, for their support for the library and their sharing their message with us this evening. Throughout his term as governor, Governor Northam has been a big supporter. We appreciate his focus on everything that has to do with the library system throughout the Commonwealth. Thank you. Corinne, that was a beautiful message. We thank you for that welcome from Dominion Energy uh, and for Dominion Energy being our lead sponsor this evening. Corinne, uh, as she mentioned, serves on our board as uh, the foundation treasurer. And we so appreciate Dominion Energy sharing her with us. Uh, she follows in the wake of our past chair, Steve Rogers, who left his position at Dominion to become an author. Um, and Steve and his wife, Kathy, are supporters this evening as well. Dominion works with and supports the library by sharing the talent of her personnel and by providing essential funding support for this and other programs in collaboration with the library. They are indeed a model of strong corporate citizenship. Thank you. Sandy Joya Treadway, thank you. Our librarian of Virginia, whose leadership of the library has been transformational. Her work on the Women's Memorial on the Capitol grounds and her visibility in the celebration of the 100th anniversary of women, the women's suffrage movement are great examples of her leadership. I am Pia Trigiani, not Adri, but Pia, and I'm here with two of our sisters, uh, Antonia and Francesca, uh, and I serve as the chair of the Foundation Library Board. My role this evening 
to join with Sandy and Corinne in thanking our sponsors, encourage more of you to become supporters, and then hand this off to our special host. Um, we have many people to thank for producing this week of programming, and it was a full week of programming here at the library to celebrate Virginia authors. But before we do, a brief commercial about the Library of Virginia Foundation. The foundation raises support for timely exhibits, wonderful programs produced by our talented library staff and professionals, and support for preservation of the special treasures that are entrusted to the Library of Virginia. Some of the programming includes initiatives that allow us to reach across the Commonwealth to serve all Virginians. That's why it's very special tonight that we join you from Big Stone Gap in the far southwest corner of Virginia. As funding availability from an appropriation of state tax do dollars is given careful scrutiny, and especially during this time, the fundraising role of the foundation is becoming increasingly important. Our foundation board is positioning the foundation to provide necessary support. We welcomed Scott Dodson as our executive director a short year ago. He has invested this first year to building a team, both staff and volunteer, to focus more intensely on financial support for the library. So we need your help and we ask for your support. We've had a generous support of a small but growing cadre of loyal library fans. In addition to Dominion Energy, tonight we thank Carol and Marcus Weinstein and past board chair Steve and Kathy Rogers for their extremely generous challenge support, which you can see described in the banner uh, at the bottom of the screen tonight. Thank you also to the law firm of Christian Barton, Christian and Barton in Richmond, Virginia, Liz and Preston Bryant. Preston is the chair of our library board, and you'll hear more from him this evening. And Anna Moser, who's currently a member of the foundation board, and her husband, Peter Schwartz, our past foundation board chair. I'm told that we are very close to meeting our fundraising challenge. Tonight, I urge you to consider joining me in supporting the library by contributing toward our challenge match by calling 804 692 3599 or visiting the link on the screen or in the comments. On behalf of all of us at the Library of Virginia and library customers, citizens of the Commonwealth and beyond whom we serve, thank you for your support. A few more thank yous. Um, first of all, our amazing Literary Awards Committee and in particular our committee uh, co-chairs, Joseph uh, Papa, or Papa I should say, and Jordana Kaufman who just who joined him this year as a co-chair. Thank you to the foundation staff with special recognition to Don Greggs for being the producer and organizer in chief of this first virtual literary awards. And thank you to our dedicated judges who read and evaluated over 140 nominations. They read each and every book and poem without their Herculean efforts. We would not have our finalists and winners this evening. Now to the main event. I have been tasked with the privilege of introducing our host for the festivities, Adriana Trigiani. And I have my sisters here with me to join me. Hi, Adriana. We can see you now. Um, applause, Pia. Oh, you have applause? Oh, okay. I have a applause machine. Oh, oh, it's an applause machine. There you go, Adriana. Yeah, very good. You pack any more relatives into the room is my question. No, but I, ha I do have, Adri, we're at the Lonesome Pine School and Heritage Center where the motto is reading, relaxing, and reminiscing. And I'm here with one of the co-founders, Jimmy Kilgore. Please, please bring in Jimmy Kilgore, will you? Where, where is Jimmy Kilgore? Jimmy, Nancy Kilgore. Jimmy Kilgore. And Karen, Karen, Karen Kilgore is here with us, too. Okay. Um, it has, they, her old majorette uniform is hanging in that. In that well, we were, we were going to have Karen twirl the baton for you tonight, but that just wasn't going to happen. That wasn't in the cards. It's all right. So let me say say a few words about you, Adri, so that you know, so that people know. Um, I think very few, Pia, because we have a big show. I know. Well, Adri was a talent, is a talent, and we recognized that our sisters early on from her appearance on Kitty College in the third grade. Um, she, it was a complete freeze out. See, there. This is this is the freeze out, Adri. They're freezing out for you. Uh, no questions answered correctly. Okay, that was part of the, the fun there. Uh, to her broadcasts as a local radio station uh, commentator. Well, you were an, a reporter, right? At WLSD. Yes, 
wisely, Scott. Get, 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 do your research. I got five dollars a story, and I was very big at WNBA radio. It was WNBA. Okay. She reported remotely. Well, she reported remotely from the town council meetings, and she also had uh, an award-winning interview uh, on the sidelines of the. Um, it was a, I guess, a strike. And Adri was in the middle of the strike, interviewing the miners who were striking for the United uh, Coal Work mine, uh, mine Workers. United Mine Workers of America. Of America. And and we also learned that she had that great talent because she was also the chaplain in our high school, Powell Valley High School. And at every assembly, she got up in front of, of, of the assembly and said a prayer. So her talents run deep and long and broad. Um, we also knew early on that she had a talent for making people feel at home and welcome for and and welcome in the way that she could spin a yarn. We have cheered on her successful storytelling career. What she does best is honor the characters in the people we have met and know here in the great Southwest and throughout New York and um, Italy, St. Mary's College. We know her as a young girl who was a cut up, had a knack for diverting attention in class and at the dinner table. Pia, this is really long winded. We have props yeah, uh, to avoid <laughs> nightly dishwashing chores. But we also know her as a kind and generous spirit. Yes. Who honors and remembers better than anywhere one her roots here in Big Stone Gap and the people that she has encountered along the way. That has produced more than 20 books, movies, and television programming. So we are very proud, Adrian. I know Tony and Cheka join me in congratulating you always, but also we know that you look, look, <laughs> that you will do a great job once again this evening. We hope. So thank, you. thank you very much. After that introduction, thank you, Pia. I have an applause machine. You know, I miss you all, but here's the truth of the matter. Peter Schwartz is probably in his cups by now, and so the bar is low. Um, a lot to say, but we have such a show for you tonight. You are going to be thrilled that you decided to spend time with us this evening because we have major American authors giving awards to major American authors. I'd like to thank the governor and his wife. They've had about the worst pandemic of anybody, haven't they? They both got the COVID and then they, they, want, they tried to kidnap them. The only thing worse for those two is if they put on weight during the pandemic, but they looked fit, they looked good. Um, I wanna say hello to Mary Lynn Cott. She gave an award last night. This is really funny doing jokes when there's no response. It's, uh, it's, it's like, it, well, it's probably how most of you feel in your marriages. Okay. Um, I want to thank uh, my sister Pia for that beautiful introduction and my sisters Tony and Francesca who were also there um, holding up things. I, I don't know what they were doing, but they looked good. Um, this is a, it's a little nepotism, can you tell? We're off the nepotism track now. Um, but Pia's law firm, Mercer Trajani, is sponsoring the event. Great. And they're a significant part of the challenge. That's pretty great. Um, you know, we come together and we do this every year because we love books and we love to read and we love libraries. And this event every year is really the, it is the celebration of the Library of Virginia. Now you might say, well, what makes them different or what, why, why is, why are our awards different? Well, Virginia is a state that is quite diverse from the mountains where we grew up in the great Southwest corner of the state through the Piedmont to the, to the ocean, to the Chesapeake. It's a beautiful state and it's a rare state. It's a Commonwealth. Um, and when we grew up the library, our mom was a librarian, but what was essential about the library to us was that it was the place where people came together. And here all these years later, it still is. So anything you can help us do at this library, help us do it. You know, 
when, when somebody has a birthday, when somebody had, you know, this year with the holidays, you could make a card that said, I gave to the Library of Virginia in your name. This means a lot to people because let's face it, during the pandemic, what else could we cook, sew, make, do, craft? Give to the library because it is a gift that is eternal and keeps on giving. Now, tonight, I am so proud to introduce um, our first author who is going to award the nonfiction uh, category. The award looks like this, folks. Can you see this? Oh, I've got smudged on there. It looks like this. It's a beautiful book, and it will be engraved for each winner. And you you come to a place, you just appreciate having this in your life because it reminds you that you're not crazy, that you actually have a job as a writer. So this is a big night for our authors, and I hope they're all in the bullpen excited. I want to tell you a few things about Thomas Dyja before he comes on the screen. Uh, to present the nonfiction award. Thomas Dyja was born and raised on the northwest side of Chicago. He's a graduate of Columbia University. That's no small feat. That's an Ivy. He worked as a bookseller on the agency side at ICM and then Bantam Books, where he dealt with everything from the original Rotisserie League series to Richard Saul Worman, creator of the TED Conference. From there, Mr. Dyja became a partner in the book packaging company Balliet and, Balliet and Fitzgerald, creating, it's actually Balliet. It's gonna be a nut like that, so stay tuned. It's gonna be more hilarious as this goes on. He created books for clients such as ESPN, they did, People Magazine, USA Today, and A&E Television, and editing four anthologies. He went on to write three novels a biography of civil rights pioneer Walter White. Everybody should read it. And he also co-wrote a book on education with former New York schools chancellor, the very, um, oh, he's spectacular, Dr. Rudy Crew. His next book, which is coming in the spring of 2021, is called New York, New York, New York, How the City Changed from Koch to Bloomberg. And it's gonna be published by Simon & Schuster. He lives in Manhattan with his wife, literary agent Su Su Suzanne Gluck, and they raised two incredible children. If my kid turns out half as well, I'm going to be very grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, for the nonfiction award, Mr. Tom Dijah. Thank you, Adri. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you, and thank you, Library of Virginia, for having me to do this. Um, this year, the nominees for the Nonfiction Award cover a wide range of stories. One, the plight to return works of art stolen by Hitler and the Third Reich to their rightful owners. The second, how rap is unevenly used in the criminal justice system to imprison often innocent black youths. And the third, a deeply personal collection of essays on race, gender, and what it's like to be a black academic in the United States. The finalists are Tressie McMillan Cottom for Thick and Other Essays, Mary M. Lane for Hitler's Last Hostages, Looted Art and the Soul of the Third Reich, and Eric Nielsen and Andrea L. Dennis for Rap on Trial, Race, Lyrics, and Guilt in America. And the winner is Tressie McMillan Cottom for Thick and Other Essays. There's applause, I guess. Um, Ms. Cotton, though, is sadly not able to join us tonight to officially accept her award, but that does give me the opportunity to say something which she probably wouldn't have, which is that uh, last week she was also recognized for another wonderful achievement, and that is the, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation selected her as one of the 2020 MacArthur Fellows. So congratulations to Ms. Cotton for that remarkable honor, and as well for this 2020 Library of Virginia Nonfiction Award. Fantastic, Tom, thank you. Live from New York, thank you so much. You did a beautiful job. It was fantastic. We're so excited about Ms. Cotton. She got the Genius Grant. Nothing but the best for you here at the Library of Virginia. Okay. I would like to recognize the esteemed judges for this year's literary awards and thank them for all of their hard work. It, they read everything and then they consult and then they decide. There were over 150 nominations this year. 
That's a lot of books. So in nonfiction, we'd like to thank Larissa Smith Ferguson, Donna M. Lucy, and John Kukla. In fiction, we'd like to thank Christine A. Patrick, Rebecca L. Pierce, and Jessica D. Scalf. And in poetry, we would like to thank Mary Flynn, Darlene, Anita Scott, and Ron Smith. Please join me in thanking them for their efforts. Now, I had a friend that I loved very much, Emil Jenkins Sexton. First of all, she was hilarious. You could call on her day or night to help you with anything in the state of Virginia, seriously. Necklaces would magically appear in my mailbox because she said, this looks like you. But she was a very gifted writer and she was a member of the Library of Virginia Foundation. She passed away in 2010, so I can't believe it's 10 years. But she left her mark on the literary community. And this was throughout the state of Virginia and beyond, everybody that read her fabulous, cozy mysteries. The Library's Fiction Award was renamed in Emil's honor to remember her dedication to the written word and to the connectivity of reading in communities. So I'm gonna invite a friend of mine. I adore this, this author, and she's on the 20th anniversary of her book, Sugar. Tell you a little bit about Bernice McFadden. Bernice McFadden is the author of the Book of Harlan. It's the winner of the 2017 American Book Award and the 2017 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work. This is in addition to eight other critically acclaimed novels, including Sugar. Everybody reads Sugar because it's the backbone of the whole collection. Loving Donovan, Gathering of Waters, and that's a New York Times editor's choice and one of the 100 notable books of 2012. Glorious, which was featured in O, the Oprah Magazine, and was a finalist for the NAACP Image Award. She is a four-time Hurston Wright Legacy Award finalist, as well as the recipient of three awards from the BCALA. Praise Song for Butterflies is her latest novel, but it was just announced in all the, the trades that she's going to write an autobiography, which I can't wait for. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Bernice McFadden. Oh, my God. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm so happy to be here. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you all this evening to introduce the Emil Jenkins Sexton Award for Fiction. The works chosen as fiction finalists this year showcase a stunning story about parents, children, and the unwavering hope of a better life in a small Virginia town, about how the promise of friendship and love may become dark secrets in the gorgeous homes of Opal Beach, and a return to the saga of the Mason and Balo families and a work of deep insight about a central dilemma of American history, the legacy of the Civil War and slavery. The fiction finalists are Angie Kim, Miracle Creek, Tara Laskowski, One Night Gone, Christopher Tilgman, Thomas, and Bill in the Midi. And the winner is Christopher Tilman for Thomas and Bill in the Midi. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, uh, Bernice. What, what, what a pleasure to be introduced by you and to have this uh, honor bestowed by you. I just, it's wonderful for me. Um, I accept, if that's really the right word, uh, this award with uh, greatest pleasure and delight. My wife, Caroline Preston, and I uh, have been to the gala four times as finalists in either fiction or finalists for People's Choice Awards. And now one of us has brought home the bacon. I'm hugely grateful. Our admiration uh, and, to and uh, pleasure, I mean, respect for the Library of Virginia is absolutely boundless. 
I mean it when I say the next time I pay my electric bill, I will do it with a small zap of gratitude to Dominion Power for supporting this event. This really is the literary celebration, annual celebration for poets and writers in Virginia, and we can only hope it'll take place for many more years. For the past 25 years or so, I've been pursuing this project of telling stories of the Chesapeake a region and telling stories for the most part based on my own family's uh, experience there. These are stories of the past and they're stories of black lives and white lives as they interweave. For two centuries, they were yoked across the horrors of, of slavery. And ever since then, we've been trying to live up to the ideals of racial justice and equity. And, and we have a long way to go, clearly. But across all these divides, there can be the healing power of love. Young love, heedless love maybe, but ordinary love, uh, ordinary hurts, ordinary forgiveness, young love trying to find its way. That's really what the Thomas and Beale and the BD is all about. It's really, the, what's being honored I think uh, tonight is, is the story, their story. But I'm very proud to, uh, accept the award on their behalf. So thank you to all, and thank you to the Library of Virginia. Fantastic. Christopher, love to Caroline. You, you both have produced such an incredible body of work, and we're thrilled that you won, and now you're gonna have one of these in your office or your living room. And Bernice McFadden, thank you. Um, you know, supporting your local library is not just supporting um, uh, the, the, the disbursement of books and knowledge and increasing of the intellect. Our libraries have become the places, the community centers of our towns and cities. Lots of folks can't afford computers. We provide them. Um, lots of folks need a place for the kids to go for story hour while mom is finishing up her shift or dad's finishing up his shift. There are, it's a multi-purpose place for senior citizens to go for the day, to read, uh, catch up on the local news, hang out with friends. The libraries are the lifeblood of our communities. So remember them in that way and support them in any way you can. It doesn't have to be big guys, small is, much appreciated. Every gift is appreciated. So we're going to move on to poetry. You know, they say that po poets save the world, and I, I really believe that. And the more poets that I meet, they seem to be people that have figured out everything, including the pandemic. They know how to be in the world. They look at the world in colors and shapes and sounds and interrelationships of human beings in ways that even novelists can't. And they do it with, in an artful way, in a way that you can read one a day and savor it and take it in. One of my favorite American poets is Anna Scotty. And she is an incredible talent. Um, she, her, her, I found her in The New Yorker. Uh, the first time. She's been appearing in The New Yorker since 2016. She's got a, a, a load of prizes and honors. Her short stories are regulars in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine and other, other publications. Her novella, Big and Bad, is coming out in the spring of 2021, and you can order it now if you're so inclined, and we're going to have it in the store, in our, in our, in our bookshop there at the Library of Virginia. Anna is a former journalist, and she's written for In Style, People, The LA Times, Traveling in Style, Bon Appetit, Los Angeles Magazine, Red Book, Good Housekeeping, Ladies Home Journal, The Trifecta of Every Woman in America, YM, and also in Sugar. She was a foreign correspondent for Who Weekly in Australia and a columnist for the late, great Buzz, The Talk of Los Angeles. She is a delight in every way, ladies and gentlemen. Anna Scotty. She's going to present our poetry work. Okay, Anna, first of all, you look like a goddess there with a ray of, I don't know, people <laughs> there behind you. Or a turkey. Oh, there you go. A Thanksgiving turkey. 
Thank you so much, Adriana. It is a pleasure to be with you all this evening to present the award for poetry. The poetry finalists include a gifted writer whose works have been called exquisitely crafted poems of heart accelerating candor and clarity. A celebrated poet confronting the challenges of age and country with wry humor and unsparing honesty. And a poet whose poems play with such fervor that every reading reveals another detail, another escape hatch the author has left for us to find. The poetry finalists are Lauren K. Alain for Honeyfish, David Huddle for My Surly Heart, and Benjamin Nakahasebe Kingsley for Colonize Me. And the winner is Benjamin Nakahasebe Kingsley for Colonize Me. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, there are a few other wonderfully amazing people that I want to thank. Uh, first and foremost, definitely, definitely librarians. Librarians who raised me and read to me. Librarians at whose feet I sat listening for hours. Librarians who smuggled me my favorite books, Goosebumps, um, and who grew in me a desire to read and most importantly, to imagine on the page and beyond. Uh, I'd also like to shout out my home, Old Dominion University, the one and only, uh, and thank some of my most favorite Virginia writers and creative colleagues, Sherry Reynolds, John McManus, Louisa Igloria, and Kent Wascom. Uh, similarly, I need to shout out all 461 of my students over these last five years. They are truly, truly the ones who pushed me over the edge of insanity and made me write this book um, because I love them. And also you can't get a teaching job without a damn book. Uh, <laughs> finally, uh, I would love to thank the person who this book is first and foremost dedicated to, the late great Native American Lovelock Paiute writer, Adrian C. Lewis. Uh, I had a hell of a time finding anyone to blurb this book before it was out. And my longtime friend, Adrian, had pity on me. He had a wonderful sense of humor and told me that, that my shitty manuscript was by his bedside. Um, and I think maybe they found it there when he passed away. Um, I know he would have loved the joke that my shitty poems uh, were what killed him. <laughs> and I want to say thank you so much, Adrian, for your love and your light and your poems. Uh, I miss you. And I hope that you would be so proud of what this book has become. And in his honor, I wanna conclude by reading just a couple words from the book's opening. From Nippon refugee who America caged, from Onondaga son who, who America imprisoned, who they couldn't board into whiteness, from rust belt trailers, from two wheelbarrow factory workers, from PA to LA to MIA to out here in West Baltimore, from counting every penny to carving the love of poems, from unheard prayers and these answered dreams, we are here, I am here, I am alive. Thanks so much. Good evening. I'm Scott Dodson, Executive Director of the Library of Virginia Foundation. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us this evening and to again recognize Dominion Energy for their long-standing support of the Library of Virginia. We look forward to seeing you next year in person once we're able to host you at the library again. While the pandemic has kept us apart, it has also allowed us to think about the Literary Awards celebration in new and exciting ways. I would like to thank all of the finalists and moderators, including Beth Ann Patrick, Dr. Luisa DeGloria, and Tracy Thomas for their time and incredibly thoughtful conversations that allowed us to extend the event to five days of insightful panel discussions about the finalists' works and their relevance to society. They helped make the week a resounding success. I would also like to take a moment to extend a special thank you to Carolyn Marcus Weinstein and Weinstein Properties, Steve and Kathy Rogers, and Mercer Trigiani 
for their generosity in issuing our Literary Awards Fundraising Challenge. It's my great pleasure to announce that with their vision and your help, this year's virtual event raised over $60,000 in support of the library's programs and initiatives. While this support is a phenomenal result in a year that's anything but normal, I encourage those that have not had a chance to contribute to consider a gift and support the library's work to collect, preserve, and share the stories of Virginia. Lastly, I would like to sincerely thank the Library of Virginia staff and the dedicated to the people of Virginia. The institution and its work is paramount to the understanding of Virginia's past to empower its future. Lastly, I, sorry, there's people in my office. We're having a little bit of technical problems. And with that, I would like to welcome another partnership to this incredible literary award celebration. And that's the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Um, their chief curator and deputy director for art and education, Michael Taylor, is having a little bit of a technical difficulty this evening. So I'm going to introduce uh, the COTS Award winner for you. Excuse me if I have to read. One thing that I would like to do tonight uh, before I before I announce the winner of the COTS Award is to extend our incredible gratitude and thanks to Nick and Mary Lynn Cotts. Cotts. Although I unfortunately started at a time where I wasn't able to meet Nick, I know that his work and his belief in the library um, were truly unmatched. And th that goes for Mary Lynn as well. The two of them have created this phenomenal award um, with the help of many people, in, including the author, Catherine Neville. And it's been truly a great partnership with BMFA and one of the only awards in the United States that celebrates both arts and literature. And this award would not exist without their firm commitment to the library, to the art, to the, to the arts, to the BMFA, and all of the wonderful authors who have been able to have their work put out there because of their help and their recognition. With that, I'm going to introduce Michael Taylor, the Chief Curator and Deputy Director for Art and Education uh, with the BMFA. Michael? Hello, good evening. We are so delighted to partner with you on this award and, and what an incredible winner you have chosen this year. Uh, Philip Deloria for this amazing book, Becoming Mary Sully. Um, you know, just a few words about Philip. He is, he was the first uh, professor of Native American history at Harvard University. And he's published several major books. But as he said last night in our, in our, in our great discussion panel, none more important than this one. And uh, so it's it's my great pleasure to be a part of this and uh, let Philip take center stage for this amazing award. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Uh, it's great to see you again <laughs> after meeting you last night. I simply want to begin by recognizing uh, Mary Lynn Cotts and Nick Cotts, um, you know, and the the fantastic previous winners um, of this award. I feel like I'm in such great uh, company, and I'm so honored um, to be here. I want to thank the Library of Virginia, um, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, um, the judges, evaluators, and administrators of the Mary Lynn Cotts uh, Award. Um, since this is an art book, it is a visual book, and, I, and of course. You know, our screen life is sort of confusing here, but I think it's really also incumbent upon me to recognize uh, my colleagues at the University of Washington Press um, who took kind of a bit of a chance on this book, right? This is the art of um, my great aunt and it was sort of sitting in a box in a basement and that's not the usual thing that um, shows up in um, sort of high gloss uh, academic publishing. So Lauren McLaughlin, the, uh, my editor there, Beth Fugit, Mike Backham, and particularly Katrina Noble who did the fantastic design work, um, you know, on this book. I also want to, um, as always, thank my, my family, my wife, Peggy Burns, um, who's always standing by my side with, uh, with everything I do, and my kids, Jackson and Lacey, um, who, who kind of grew into their later maturity um, you know, during the course of this book and were delightful partners along the way. And most particularly my mom, Barbara Deloria. Um, she was the custodian and caretaker of this art and sort of look after it um, 
for three decades. Um, and it is really through her efforts uh, and her sort of steadfast loyalty and her belief in the art um, that it is here with us um, today. And then finally, just to thank and recognize and acknowledge Mary Sully herself, my great aunt, um, also known as Susan Deloria, for leaving, leaving us this incredibly rich treasure um, of visual work behind. Um, as Michael said, I talked last night about how this really was the best project of my, of my career. And that is because it is the best material that I've ever had to work with or that I ever anticipate being able to work with. So um, I cannot tell you how thankful and grateful and honored I am um, you know, to receive the, the COTS Award. Um, and I just want to simply say thank you. Wow, congratulations. Um, the, the book is a masterpiece and, and we're thrilled that you, that Mary Lynn and Nick's award went to you because it, you, it, it really is a stupendous achievement. Thank you so much. I mean, it really, um, I cannot tell you how gratified I am. I have the award right here. <laughs> <We're> so <laughs> glad. Sitting they right on my desk. Uh, know it. You know, um, I, I was, I'm so glad that you mentioned that you were married because you know, when, when Michael Taylor came on with that accent, you know, uh, a lot of the ladies were swiping left. I mean, you know, it's good that you're, you know, <laughs> I don't know how hard it is to do jokes and and only me with my applause machine. But but congrats. I'm laughing with you. <laughs> I know. I see you're getting it completely. Um, but but very very thrilled to meet you here, even in in, in cyberspace. It's great. Like our pandemic of uh, you know this is the pandemic version. Listen, usually there's a big party. It's Virginia style. What can I tell you? It, they they know how to party. So hopefully next year we'll see you. That would be fantastic. Okay, great. And, and and lots of love to your whole family. Thanks so much. Take care. Listen, all I can tell you is I'm getting the comments over here and the women think these guys are cute and it's good if they say they're married. You know, this is the, the this is the Library of Virginia pandemic of pandemic version slash grinder version. Okay. Now we're going to heat up with the People's Choice Award. Hey, listen, this is all careening towards Douglas Brinkley, my friend, who I adore. And it's going to be, you, you're going to love him so much, you're not going to believe it. But first, okay, here's the deal with the People's Choice Awards. If you grew up in a place like Big Stone Gap, and a lot of you did, people used to run for things and they would take like a peanut butter jar when it was empty and, and smash a hole in the top and then put their school picture on it. You know, if they wanted to be Halloween princess, you know, or, you know, if you, um, you know, if you were raising funds for something. So that's really what the people's choice award is modeled after is we have jars, cans, and boxes in every library and you, the reader, chooses the winner. Now I couldn't think of anybody more a more perfect author to give the People's Choice Award than the great Silas House. To read Silas is to love him, to know him is to love him, to be a student of his at Berea is to love him. And here's a few things about Silas House who's just a stone's throw from Big Stone Gap over the line to Kentucky. Silas House is a nationally best-selling writer whose work frequently appears in the New York Times. He is a former commentator for NPR and his work has been widely published in journals and magazines. He has lectured internationally and is widely regard regarded as one of the major voices and writers of the American South. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, Sojourners, Oxford American, Newsday, Bayou, the Louisville Review, Night Train, Appalachian Heritage, Wind, and many other publications. He's been featured on CNN, NPR, uh, among other television uh, stations. His work has been anthologized in such books as Best Food Writing of 2014, News Stories from the South, The Year's Best, to, uh, Year's Best in 2004, Appalachian Gateway, Degrees of Elevation, and many others. Silas served as a writer in residence at Eastern Kentucky University in 2004 and 2005, and at Lincoln Memorial University, we call it LMU, from 2005 to 2010. 
And at LMU, he also directed the Mountain Heritage Literary Festival. In 2010, Silas became the NEH Chair in Appalachian Studies at Berea College. And if you haven't been to Berea, it's a treat. And, it, and you know about Berea College, that's the school, really it is the flagship of the, of the South where students get an incredibly proper uh, traditional education with an artistic bent unlike any, any school in the world. Um, he uh, was selected as the, the uh, they actually have the Silas House Literary Festival at Emory and Henry College, another favorite of ours in Emory. University of Shepherdstown in West Virginia, another amazing place. And in 2014, he was given an honorary doctorate of letters by Eastern Kentucky University. And he, in 2015, he received the Caritas Medal for his commitment to social justice. If you want to understand and, and dive in to the beauty of the people of the Appalachian Mountains, read Silas House, get to know Silas House, and it's my honor to introduce my beloved friend, Silas House. Hi, Adri. Thank you Doing so much. Good. For I was looking, you dusted kind words. Us. You dusted for us, didn't you? Dusted, you know, clean. <laughs> well, I tried to. <laughs> Honey, you know, yes, it looks yes. good. It looks good, and I like the candle, very zen. It's perfect for yes. you to introduce the people's choice in nonfiction, and I'm punting to you now. Anything for you, Adri. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, tonight's People's Choice Nonfiction finalists represent a collection of very personal essays, a biography of possibly America's greatest soldier slash statesman since George Washington, a portrait of our first president's mother, a fasty, clever, and fun blueprint for modern motherhood, and the origins of a great university in the dilemmas of Virginia slavery. This year's nonfiction finalists for the People's Choice Awards are Tressy McMillan Cotton, Thick and Other Essays, David L. Roll for George Marshall, Defender of the Republic, Craig Shirley for Mary Ball Washington, Alan Taylor for Thomas Jefferson's Education, and Catherine Winch for Slay Like a Mother. And this year's winner is Craig Shirley for Mary Ball, Washington. Congratulations. Thank you, Silas, very much. I want to thank uh, Sarah Treadway, Don Greggs, uh, and Scott Dodson with the, uh, with the Library of Virginia. The Library of Virginia is a national treasure uh, to be cherished. And uh, I, I grew up walking through libraries and spending hours in libraries. And I, I love the smell of books even now. And so oh, it's just a very great honor for me to receive this uh, award. Uh, I know Doug Brinkley is uh, speaking later. He's an old friend of mine. Uh, and I've often thought, you know, the Library of Congress uh, constituted a, um, a, a poet laureate many years ago at the beginning of the Republic. Uh, and I think that's been wonderful down through the 230 plus odd years. But I've often thought that America should have also constituted a, a, uh, a historian laureate. One can imagine that if somebody like Doug Brinkley had been there at the time in 1961 and warned John Kennedy about the Bay of Pigs and the threat and the and, and cast, that being Castro's favorite fishing hole and how it was a mistake, or warning George Bush later that nobody had successfully conquered Afghanistan since Hannibal 2,000 years ago. Oh, and I can't think of anybody who would make a greater historian laureate than uh, than Doug Brinkley. Um, I developed an early appreciation for history because of my, my mother and my father. My father, God rest his soul, my mother's watching tonight in Rochester, New York. Um, I wasn't taken to, and my brother and sister, we weren't taken to Disney World and Disneyland or you know theme parks and things like that. We went to Mount Vernon and Gettysburg and Ford's Theater, and uh, uh, we walked the, the Freedom's Trail in Boston, and I guess it was that early uh, appreciation for for all history, uh, but for me, for American history, uh, comes from my uh, my parents, and I, I can't thank them enough. Uh, some years ago, 
uh, I had a uh, friend who's since passed away, God rest his soul, David Dunham, who was, uh, who was the uh, head of marketing for Thomas Nelson Books. And he always told me, he said, if you ever have a good idea for a book, pass it along. And I was, uh, I was in politics. I was doing consulting. I had no thought of, uh, of writing books. This was 15, 20 years ago. And I had an idea for a book. Uh, it was on the 1976 Reagan campaign, which, uh, which set up the stage for him to run, win in 1980. And, and he said, that's a good idea. Why don't you help me find a writer? Well, I went through Washington and I asked, you know, columnists and reporters and people who were there. And nobody could do it. And I several weeks later i reported the sad fact back to david and uh he said six little words that changed the course of my life he said why don't you do it and uh i i said uh, okay what do i do he said well i need you need to write a treatment and i said what's a treatment and he laughed at that he said i'll send you some templates and uh, you can study those and so i wrote my own treatment and Three weeks later, I got a, a contract and a, and a, and a, and a check. And the, bad, the good news is I got a contract and a check. The bad news is I got a contract and a check. So I said about writing that book, and it set me my, my feet on a path that uh, I hadn't intended to go down before. So it, uh, little things can often change the arc of your uh, life. Uh, I want to thank my, uh, my children, Matthew, Andrew, uh, Taylor, and Mitchell. My, uh, my daughter-in-law, Brittany, my son-in-law, Kevin, uh, the staff at Shirley McVicker, and my business partner, Kevin McVicker, uh, Scott Maurer, who is my research assistant, the, the, simply the best researcher uh, I've ever worked with, just a, a fabulous individual. Uh, Hannah Long, who is the editor at HarperCollins. Um, my wife, editor, uh, uh, who edits all my work, Serene Shirley, I want to thank her. Um, and I guess uh, finally, as I just want to part with uh, my, my experiences, the search for history is the imperfect search for perfection. Uh, and I would just want to say to the people listening here tonight, watching here tonight, is that we've all experienced history. We've all witnessed history. We've all touched history. Whatever you do, whatever, write it down, because this is invaluable to historians, all of your experiences, especially those of us who like to write, write history from the, um, the bottom, from the bottom up. Famous philosopher once said, a generation which ignores history has no past, no future. I happen to subscribe to that. So I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you to the Library of Virginia. You've given me a memory which will live in my heart forever. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Craig. Congratulations. Your, your, your book is on the way. Your award. Something Craig said that really struck me about, you know, he, he went off to, to, to talk about this book and this idea and only in really, there's no other industry that I can think of that you can be in the world and you can be, you can think you're one thing and an idea strikes you and soon you become an author. The beautiful thing about being an author is there's no, there, 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 there's no conditions to it except your love of the written word and your passion for a subject. So congratulations, Craig. Very happy, happy to see you here. Okay, so now we do the people's uh, choice in fiction. Now again, the boxes are in the libraries, they're on the bookmobiles, they're everywhere where there are readers, there are these boxes for you to vote. And I reached out to my friend Chris Bajalian because he is one of, or one of our great American treasures. Um, he writes consistently year after year, award-winning, beautiful fiction. In a vast array of topics, he's one of those. He's, he's a, an author that can do anything. And he also is supportive of other authors and he writes reviews. He's, he's that guy, amazing. And an Oprah pick. He's the number one New York Times bestselling author of 21 books, Chris Bojalian. His work, my favorite, I love them all, Chris, but when you write about your Armenian roots, I'm besotted. 
His work's been translated into 35 languages and they've become movies three times. That means there will be more. His new novel is called The Red Lotus and it was published in March and debuted as a national bestseller. An American man vanishes on a rural ro road in Vietnam and his girlfriend, an emergency room doctor, trained to ask questions, follows a path that leads her home to the very hospital where they met. He writes stories. I I'm always amazed at Chris Bajalian because he's always prescient in his subject matter. His 2018 novel, The Flight Attendant, debuted as a New York Times, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Publishers Weekly, and national indie-bound bestseller. It is currently being filmed for an eight-hour HBO Max limited series, starring Kaylee Cuoco, one of our favorites, uh, Rosie Perez, uh, Michael uh, Hoosman, Game of Thrones and the Haunting of Hill House, Zosha Mamet, Terrific, and T.R. Knight. It is expected to start streaming in late 2020, which is soon. Here's a few of Chris's awards. The Walter Surf Medal for Outstanding Achievement in the Arts, the ANCA Freedom Award for his work educating Americans about the Armenian Genocide, which I just mentioned, and the Letters Award to the Sandcastle Girls, as well as the St. Mesra Mashto Medal, the New England Society Book Award for the Night Strangers, the New England Book Award uh, for Russian So Glossy Concord Award for the Sandcastle Girls. Also, a Boston Public Library Literary Light, a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award for Transistor Radio. A Best Lifestyle Column for Idle Banter from the Vermont Press Association and the Anayad Literary Award. His novel Midwives was a number one New York Times bestseller and selected by Oprah for her book club. He was also, with that book, a New England Booksellers Association discovery pick. You can see him on his bike all over Vermont. That's our Chris. He's written for all kinds of magazines and newspapers, including the Washington Post, where his reviews have appeared of other people's novels and books. Also the Boston Globe Sunday Magazine. And he was a weekly columnist in Vermont for the Burlington Free Press from 1992 through 2015. He is a superstar. Ladies and gentlemen, we're honored to have Chris Bojalian. Adriana, that was so sweet of you and way too long. I miss you, I hope you're well. I miss you and love you and send love to your family. And to yours. Libraries rock, librarians rule. Really thrilled to be here. Right. Our People's Choice and Fiction Award nominees represent a variety of amazing books that stir the imagination. Our finalists include a remarkable tour of the law's tricks and hidden trap doors for a down on his luck attorney, a suspenseful laugh out loud page turner, and an incisive inspection of privilege, race, and class, a work that carefully pieces together the tense atmosphere of a courtroom drama and the complexities of life as an immigrant family, a work filled with action, conspiracy and romance, and a world poised on the brink of madness as a mysterious outbreak spreads across the nation, and a book called A Beautiful Reminder that though we may be busying ourselves seeking what we want, what we need has an uncanny way of finding us. This year's five fiction finalists for the People's Choice Awards are Martin Clark, The Substitution Order, Bruce Halsinger, the Gifted School, Angie Kim, Miracle Creek, Tashka Lee, The Line Between, and Sonia Yorig, True Places. And the envelope shows this is a COVID friendly envelope. The award for People's Choice in Fiction goes to 
Martin Clark for the substitution order. Martin Clark is unable to join us this evening, but always forward thinking. He's prepared his acceptance by video. Hello and good evening from Patrick County and a, a special um, hello and good evening to my old pal, Adriana Trigiani. It's hard to believe we've been in this racket for two decades now. Um, I am really grateful, really happy to win this award and thank you so much. Thanks to the Library of Virginia. Um, I also want to acknowledge and mention the other writers. Every book nominated in this category is excellent and every writer is just absolutely the best. Um, I also uh, want to thank all my friends and neighbors from uh, Patrick County, Virginia. Um, my pal Ed Martin. Um, Ed used to run into the stores back in 2000 and uh, shill for me, buy one book, and, and tell everybody how good in many aspects of mobile home living is. Um, also, the eWizard, uh, whose Facebook page has almost a million followers, uh, Chip Slate, Gary Fiskajon, and two of the best in the business, Gabrielle Brooks, the legend, and Sarah Eagle from Knopf Publishing. Uh, I'd like to also thank my, uh, my, my uh, godsend surgeon, Dr. Stacy Q. Wolf, who fixed the hole in my head back, in, back a few years ago. And the biggest thanks possible to Dina Clark, my sweetheart, gorgeous wife, always the uh, finest lady in the joint, even if that joint is virtual. So uh, hopefully next year we'll all be together in person. Thanks again. And as I once heard my writing hero say, uh, Larry Brown say to Barry Hanna, uh, let's go into town and get a cold beer to celebrate. Thanks so much and good night. Thank you, Martin, for wearing your mask. Wear them properly, folks, but wear, wear your mask. Wear them. You know, that, that's so Martin Clark to just really make a statement. He is, he's one, I mean, what a writer, a great, great novelist. Yeah, I can't believe it's 20 years either we're doing this, Martin. I used to follow Martin on tour, and that meant I had to tip more. He's a tipper, that I can tell you. Now, um, excited now because we're, we're moving towards, and by the way, congratulations, Martin Clark. You just, you're amazing and all our novelists, all of our nonfiction writers. You know, the thing about the Library of Virginia, you keep, you write another one, you'll win another year. Look at Chris, he told us, I mean, come on. So keep the faith and keep steady and wear your mask and we'll survive this thing. I'm gonna introduce Preston Bryant, who's gonna introduce Douglas Brinkley, our featured speaker tonight. And um, wow, this is, a, this is an incredible resume, but I wanna share it with you because this is a major player in the state of Virginia and you need to know that. Preston Bryant Jr. is a senior vice president at McGuire Woods Consulting where he works in the firm's infrastructure and economic development group. Preston was a partner for nearly 10 years at Hurt and Profit Incorporated, a Virginia-based civil engineering surveying and planning firm. If you're like me, I'm a gog at engineers. People who can look at something, know where things go, how to build things. So I'm already a Preston Bryant Jr. fan. He also represented the city of Lynchburg in Amherst County in the Virginia House of Delegates for 10 years, which means he's, he's run for elected office. Let's see how, if he looks good still. That'll kill you. He uh, was house patron of the state's nationally regarded public-private partnership statute known as the PPEA. He passed landmark legislation on the wetlands conservation. Good for you, Preston developed the nation's largest market-based nutrient credit exchange program, phosphorus and nitrogen. Okay, explain that. What are, what are you talking about? I mean, I really should have Googled that. I don't know what that is. To advance upgrades to more than 100 wastewater treatment plants and overhauled Virginia stormwater management programs. I have a little better idea what that is. 
Preston was the Virginia Secretary of Natural Resources in the cabinet of Governor Timothy M. Kane, currently serving as United States Senator. He's one of uh, my favorite statements, sta statements, statesmen, right next to Governor Linwood Holton, who's his father-in-law. You see, it all comes full circle. I had half my family on, and now you get all the connection. He um, led the state's six environmental, recreational, wildlife, and historic resources agencies, a staff of 2,200 people and a $420 million annual budget. He also helped write Virginia's first ever statewide energy plan. That's amazing. In 2009, President Obama appointed Preston to chair the National Capital Planning Commission, the central planning agency for all federal lands and buildings in Washington, D.C., suburban Maryland, and Northern Virginia. He held that position until September 2018. He was then appointed by the Library of Virginia Board by Governor Terry McAuliffe in 2016, and he has served as library board chair since July 1st, 2019. I mean, I am, I'm really a gog here. We have a superstar coming right on to introduce Douglas Brinkley, our featured speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, Preston Bryant Jr. Hey, Adrian. Preston. You almost make energy and wastewater engineering sound exciting. Nobody can do that with exciting. you. Exciting. What can I say? It's exciting. Uh, wow. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that we're not uh, in Richmond together tonight. Uh, we look forward to all of this being behind us, all of this unpleasantness being behind us. And we're all in Richmond next year at the beautiful Library of Virginia celebrating. I am Preston Bryant, and I do have the privilege of chairing the library board and I want to thank everyone who has participated in all of the presentations and panel discussions this week who are joining us tonight and who have contributed to the library foundation. Your support is needed. We're grateful for it. It's my pleasure now to introduce Douglas Brinkley. Douglas Brinkley is the Catherine Sanoff Brown Chair of Humanities and he's a professor of history at Rice University in Houston. He is a CNN presidential historian. He's a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. He works in many capacities in public history, including for boards and museums and colleges and historical societies. Six of his books were New York Times Notable Books of the Year. Seven of his books were New York Times bestsellers. His book, The Great Deluge, Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans and the Mississippi Gulf, Co Gulf Coast received the Robert F. Kennedy uh, Human Rights Book Award. He was personally selected by Nancy Reagan to edit President Reagan's presidential diaries. His two volume, uh, the Nixon tapes, the annotated Nixon tapes, won the author S. Link Warren F. Kuehl Prize. And in 2017, the New York Historical Society named Dr. Brinkley as their official U.S. presidential historian. He's on the Board of Trustees of Brevard College and the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Presidential Library. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and the James Madison Council of the Library of Congress. But before Douglas Brinkley joins us this evening, the Library of Virginia would like to present him with an honorary award in recognition of his outstanding contributions to American history and literature as an award-winning, best-selling author and presidential historian. So thank you, Dr. Brinkley, for all that you have done and all that you do to tell our great American story. Ladies and gentlemen, Douglas Brinkley. Well, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. I, I care deeply about all the great work you've done for Virginia and the realm of uh, the environment and wetlands protection. Um, the conservation is my great, um, great, great uh, passion, which I've written about quite a bit. Um, and my great uh, friend, Adriana, thank you. I wouldn't be here, I think, but not for you. I love you so much. You've been, uh, you're just a joy of a human being to know, and you've done a great job with this this evening. I've been watching. I'm in Austin, Texas, and we have a clock ticking for a presidential election coming. And as a presidential historian and speaking to Virginia, where, where so many presidents 
came from, I thought I'd be remiss if I didn't say something about 2020. But I'm going to say something from a historian's lens and try to be nonpartisan, which is almost an impossible feat to do. But of, of all the books I've, I've written, I, the, there, I wanted to begin with one I did call Rightful Heritage um, on Franklin D. Roosevelt in the Land of America. I don't know if people realize that he was in Charlottesville uh, in 1944, bird watching, and he was with General Pa Watson laying low as June 3rd to the 4th and June 5th, meaning as we were getting ready in 1944 for D-Day, um, he left Virginia just to come to the White House and then announce that big day, um, you know, for our country. Um, but FDR, out of all the people I've written about, all the presidents, just astounding. The fact is that from 1932 to 1980, with the election of Ronald Reagan, we lived in the age of FDR, uh, which meant that when he got inaugurated that Mar in March of 1933, and incidentally, very early, came to Virginia to look at the Blue Ridge Parkway um, and just put up the first civilian conservation court camp in Virginia. Uh, but FDR um, stood for big government that we, the government, Uncle Sam's gonna make your life better. It was a great message with the New Deal. And we look at those first 100 days of FDR with astonishment of all of the programs that would start coming to help people on soil conservation, if you were a farmer, or you know, building with the WPA of tunnels and bridges, the planting of billions of trees, it, it just rained federal government programs. And FDR used to say, I'm just throwing ideas up against the wall and see what sticks. But he was able through his optimism to convince America that the federal government was your friend, that capitalism and democracy and freedom and justice and liberty were going to survive, that we weren't going to go down the drain with the Great Depression. And that was no uh, small feat. And this coming from a man uh, in a wheelchair with polio so saying we have nothing to fear but fear itself and leading our country to, to uh, better days to come. Not just did he win in 1932, but he won again in 1936 and then 1940 and then 1944. We had to create a constitutional amendment to stop FDRism, if, if he didn't die in 1945, he may have, uh, who knows how many more terms he could have gotten elected. But the principal message of, of Roosevelt's, the government's here to help you. You see that with social security in 1935 or the industrial mobilization efforts where cities like Norfolk became a hub during World War II of federal government working with the private sector and the armed forces. And he, the Manhattan Project um, of, of ending the war at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the war against Japan. It's all government programs, government. And then we, he died and Harry Truman came in. And Harry Truman continued. His fair deal was the New Deal. And Harry Truman created the CIA, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Pentagon of Virginia, or the, the, the birth of the first Department of Defense with the Secretary of Defense, as uh, Harry Truman, National Security Advisor. He, the government integrated the armed forces on civil rights. Now you could say, well, Truman lived truly in the shadow of FDR, but what about Dwight D. Eisenhower? Well, Eisenhower won the presidency in 1952 and again in 1956, saying the government is here to help you. It's bipartisan. It's Eisenhower who builds the interstate highway systems, the greatest public works project in world history. It's Eisenhower who connects the Great Lakes to the Atlantic via the St. Lawrence Seaway. It's Eisenhower who sends in federal troops to help integrate Central High School in Little Rock in the wake of the 1954 Brown versus Topeka Supreme Court ruling. Um, and, and you might say, well, Eisenhower rolled with big government, but what about Kennedy? Well, of course, Kennedy was continuing as a Democrat 15 years after the death of FDR when he ran for president. His new frontier had ideas about how the government's going to make your life better. If Eisenhower created NASA in 1958, 
to compete with the Soviets. Kennedy said, we're going to put a man to the moon by the end of the decade and bring them back alive. The we was going to be led once again by the federal government. The we of going to the moon was engineers and computer specialists and technicians, universities, colleges, uh, Fortune 500 companies, many in Virginia, pulling together to go to the moon by the end of the decade with, with in fact, Virginia pay, playing a very large role um, uh, on the moon Apollo effort. Lyndon Johnson just rain belief in the federal government. He tried to make the great society bigger than the New Deal. He wanted to become the next FDR. He created Medicaid and Medicare, which are essentially birthrights now like Social Security. He did all sorts of innovative things with urban housing, welfare reform, Head Start, you know, uh, Appalachian Trail, you know, as a net federal trail going through Virginia, uh, uh, wild and scenic river designations. It just, if you go to the Lyndon Johnson Library, you can just see carved in marble, just hundreds of laws of growing of government under FDR. Then you might think, well, certainly, I mean, under Lyndon Johnson, and you might think, well, certainly FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson were about the big government, federal government's here to help you. What about Nixon? Well, Richard Nixon is the one who created the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970. He created the Clean Air Act in 70 and the Endangered Species Act of 1973. He was pro-affirmative action, Richard Nixon. He still had to live in the long shadow of FDR. Jimmy Carter would come on the scene and create FEMA and Department of Energy, and then Ronald Reagan. And, the, and, and so I'm suggesting that Rooseveltism is the big political force, and it's replaced by Reaganism by 1980. And Craig Shirley won the nonfiction uh, award this evening as the dean of Reagan studies. He knows more about President Reagan and writes more authoritar authoritatively about him than anybody. Um, and he, he was, a, I'm, I'm so pleased he won the nonfiction award. Um, but Reagan came in and started saying, whoa, too much federal government. That may be uh, a lot, too much taxation. Um, you, it was mentioned that I edited Reagan's diaries. And in those diaries, Reagan wrote, everybody says I'm against FDR. I voted for FDR four, four times. Uh, I couldn't have, have grown up without help from the New Deal. What I want to do is roll back the great society. And from 1980 to the present, we lived in the age of Reagan, which is a kind of conservative pragmatism center right where you have to negotiate to get things done. Now, you might say, all right, how at Reagan, eight years got you. And then you've got George Herbert Walker Bush. Um, and, and but by 1992, Bill Clinton won and won two terms. Well, first off, remember. Bush 41 got in massive trouble when he said, read my lips, no new taxes. The Reagan world meant you never say I'm gonna raise taxes anymore. And Bill Clinton wins in 1992 in large part because Ross Perot got 19% of the vote as a third party candidate, the most successful third party candidate since Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. And Perot, a billionaire from Dallas, and the Bushes from Houston, and there's Bill Clinton in 1992, who never, who got only got a percentage in the 40s, not, didn't hit 50 percent in that election. Meaning most Americans didn't vote for Bill Clinton in 92, but Clinton believed in the F that we could still govern in the age of Roosevelt, and he tried to do a kind of universal or affordable care act in 1993 with Hillary Clinton leading the charge, and he got slammed, Clinton. And in 1994, Newt Gingrich came and you had the contract with America and Bill Clinton being a brilliant politician pivoted and adopted age of Reagan, meaning um, more centrist to center right policies as his own. You see Bill Clinton being saying, I'm going to reform welfare. I'm going to balance a budget. I'm going to create a surplus. These were coming out of the center, center right. Um, he triangulated to survive, in other words. Now you might say, all right, that's Clinton.
But what about you know George W. Bush tried to out Reagan Reagan, and then you then what about Barack Obama? Well, I got to go regularly to the White House with President Obama. He would have David McCullough and Doris Kearns Goodwin and Robert Carroll and a few of us there and had these dinners. And from that period of the Obama years, you know, he did do a big FDR government thing with the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. He got it through with the bailout of General Motors and his stimulus package. And then, boom, he hit the wall of the Tea Party. Barack Obama spent the next next years, next seven years, basically on a, a as a firewall president, defending the heirlooms of Roosevelt, um, the long government. Meaning, Obama would say, "You're not going to drill in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. You're not going to touch Social Security. You're not going to mess with the Civil Rights Acts of '64 and '65. You're not going to touch Medicaid and Medicare." He had to try to become a protector of all of the accomplishments of the age of Roosevelt. And then, of course, Donald Trump won in 1916. And I don't know what era we're in right now. There is mass sense of confusion, dysfunctionalism, a kind of neo-civil war. It seems that the age of Reagan is closed. And they're now historical eras. We look at the uh, as FDR and Ronald Reagan as the two very large political figures of, of our more recent lifetime. But Trump is either going to be a revolutionary figure who re-owns the Republican Party and made it his own if he gets reelected. He'll be seen as somebody who shattered the consensus of the Cold War and post-Cold War, uh, Cold War globalism and became a kind of nativist, isolation, American first, big power character um, who's um, able to reinvent the Republican Party. Or if he loses, he will be seen as a one-off fluke president who didn't win the popular vote in 2016, who joined Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton wearing the eye for impeachment, uh, will be remembered um, yes, for three Supreme Court justices, but also for xenophobic and racist language and bigotry and crazy um, tweets and divide and conquer language. So we don't know how Donald Trump's going to be viewed in history. But what we can tell right now is this really is a battle for America. And it, and who, it, it won't be for just who wins this election, but for the new age we're going to emerge in. I'll end by telling you it's ironic that the new age we're going to be living in is going to be led by somebody in their 70s, mid to late 70s, um, Trump and Biden, uh, two white men in their late 70s. Uh, it'll be historic if Kamala Harris becomes the first woman vice president. It'll be as, in many ways just as um, revelatory and big as when Obama became the first African-American president. So on this Time clock we're in now, all you could do is vote. If you're for Trump, vote for him. And if you're you're for Joe Biden, vote, get out there, register, care about the democracy. Because I've spent my whole life writing American history, and I'm very keen to say that we that our own times aren't uniquely oppressive. We are dealing with COVID-19, we are dealing with unemployment, poverty. It's an anguished time. But American history gives us a, a guiding light to tell us we can get through this somehow. And hopefully we'll get through it without voter suppression, without Russian interference, and we'll be able to hold an election in 2020 that we're proud of. I really appreciate the Library of Virginia embracing me and giving me this uh, award. It means a great deal to me. I love everything about Virginia. I love the Library of Virginia, and I'm going to be there in Richmond next year um, because I just love what all of you do. Thank you very, very much. Douglas, that was perfect. Tried. I try to do it for you in a middle, middling way, keep everybody happy. This is just in lieu of, you know, to remind everybody to wear their mask. I think, you know, I when it. I have mine on me. I'm at home, though. When things are chaotic, hand sanitizer and you know, wash our hands, but you made some beautiful, you drew the line from FDR to, the, to today. 
And I guess what what you're saying at the end was really you have to choose the kind of country you want to live in. That is. That's exactly right. And uh, we had gonna... Rose America, oh, Rachel America, and now we're into something new. But I want to remind folks, and this, this is at the Library of Virginia shop, American Moonshot, which is the quintessential book about Kennedy and the space race and what happened. And, you know, you write history like the page turner it is. This is another favorite of mine, especially in light of the um, all that's going on in the environment. If you read this, you get it. And then, of course, I have to say this is one of my favorites because of what we share with the Bob's Merrill biographies. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, good. I'm so glad you have Cronkite there. Well, I'm writing right now about Rachel Carson. I'm writing a book, Silent Spring Revolution. Right. John John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Nixon, and that long 60s environmental movement. Well, let me tell you, everybody in Virginia cares about those issues deeply because it's, it's not only beautiful, it, we have everything from the ocean to the mountains, and we, you know, it, it's, it's all there. So you're going to have a lot of fans, and we hope to see you next year at the Library of Virginia Awards, Douglas. Congratulations on your award. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I, I love all you. Thank you so much. Have Keep a great faith. night. Keep the faith and love to Anne and the kids. She's right behind me. Oh, I'm glad. She's, did she do the light? She ate plus. She plugged me in and put the light on. I hope it was all right. Oh, it was perfect. You look very statesmanlike. Oh, uh, well, I'm trying. I, I, was, I was trying to be presentable for you. And the, and the tie is perfect. Green for Virginia. Yeah, well, green for the planet. The green blue planet. That's right. Green and blue. Green and blue. Thank you, Douglas. Congratulations. Uh, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. you know, I love Douglas Brinkley. I love his wife. I love his kids. That is a fine family. And again, words of wisdom. Before I leave you tonight, do you love this? I, I'm not doing it like Nancy Pelosi. Does. Like she does it. It looks good. It looked, you know what it looks like? I look like one of those people that have a toothache in a Western movie with my mask down. I'm a, I, I look like I'm, yeah. And it, you know, everything's available at the Virginia shop. All of our nominees books are available. There's nothing like the gift of a book, but they have so much more in the Virginia shop and it's kind of killing me. I have to shop online. I can't be there and peruse in person, but everything you want that's book related. I'm sure they have masks. Um, I would like to thank Sandy Treadway, Scott Dodson, Don, Don Greggs. We almost killed that woman. George, who's in charge of all the technical. I didn't see a single glitch. I've never seen anything like this. You know, when I'm, I'm a pandemic princess, I'm always on the internet. Peter Schwartz, Anna Moser, super couple. Uh, right about now, Anna's just, you know, getting him off the couch. Going to make him a pot of coffee, sober him up. I'm totally teasing. Um, one of my dear friends who I, who, who I just adore her, Carol Weinstein and her handsome husband, Marcus. Carol is such a supporter of the Library of Virginia that we cannot have an award show go by and not mention her devotion to the poet. Preston and Lynn Bryant. I was very impressed with Preston, a little above my pay grade, but I, I tried to understand, you know, I'm reading. And Corin Arnett, I'd like to end with Corin. Well, I'm going to thank my sisters, you know, who showed up in a tribe and lovely. Uh, Corin Arnett is going to get the award tonight for the movie star look during the pandemic. She was cool and crisp. I don't know how she did it. Looked great delivered her, it didn't sound written, it sounded very off the cuff. Corinne Arnett, you have a job. So to all of you tonight who joined us, thank you. Keep the faith, look out for people with COVID, help them, they need us now more than ever. And to the, to the governor and Governor Ralph Northam and his Beautiful wife, the first lady of Virginia, Pamela Northam. I'm so glad you weren't kidnapped. And I, you look in great health. 
God bless you and keep leading us forward in the state of Virginia, along with our beautiful people. Visit the Library of Virginia when you can and support it always. And that's it for me. Masks up in Martin Clark style. Everybody wear your masks. Good night. God bless. And see you next year. My nose is too large for the mask. And I am now fogging. Good night. Thank you, and see you next year in person at the Library of Virginia.